Happy World Wushu Day to everybody. Uh, it's been quite an honor to do all these uh, these weapon seminars, these weapon webinars. Uh, it's been um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to share the information. And I've got to express my gratitude to the USAWKF, Matt Wong, Kevin Law, and everybody who's worked so hard to put this together for everybody during this uh, horrible pandemic. Um, so uh, this is the finale of my trilogy. Uh, the first one was on authenticity. The second webinar was on reality. And both of those were very related in terms of the theoretical sense of how we use weapons. This last one is on care and maintenance. And this is very practical. This is something I think everybody should really know. I mean, just like you need to know how to put gas in your car, you need to know how to take care of your weapons. Um, the first thing I want to uh, tell everybody in terms of uh, don't doing this, don't do this at home, is uh, if you're dealing with sharps, because my last two webinars were talking about sharps, you've got to be very careful about weapon care. Uh, sharps are very dangerous, and you can cut yourself so easily and so quickly. And so be mindful to that. Um, also, uh, real blades, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but real blades oxidize. Uh, so um, your hands have a lot of oil in them, right? Humans are oily. Uh, you may not be so oily right now because we're all washing our hands really well, and so your hands are super dry. But um, if you have glasses, uh, you know. And if you, you deal with a touchscreen or even on your, or on your iPhone, or what have you, you know how much oil your hands puts out because it's always greasy, you're always cleaning that. Uh, that can go onto your blades very easily if you have real steel. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more later too. So uh, my main take home from there is uh, uh, if you're dealing with top shelf, high-end weapons, um, uh, you've got to be very careful and very mindful on how you uh, take care of them. Just like if you had a Ferrari, you take have to take care of it a lot more um, with a lot more care. And I'm not really going to get too much on that into that. I'm just going to touch on sort of basic uh, maintenance and care of weapons. The other big caveat, do not try to restore an antique. If you have an actual antique weapon, not one of these mass produced ones that all of us use, um, or even a modern weapon, uh, don't try to restore it if it's in, you know, if it's all rusty or what have you, it's in bad condition. Don't do that. Um, stabilize it, but but don't try to take all that rust off. Don't try to re-edge it. Don't touch it unless you know what you're doing. This little YouTube video isn't really enough information. And one mistake could um, destroy decades or even centuries worth of history. When I was in high school, uh, one of my friends uh, had uh, acquired a sword, and it wasn't a—it wasn't an extraordinary piece. It was a Knights of Columbus sword, and he had bought it. This was long before there was such a thing as being online, but he had bought it through mail order. And uh, his father had a shop, and so he tried to sharpen it, and he totally ruined it. Um, <laughs> and it was—you uh, know—he was a high school kid, and he had saved up to get this sword. It wasn't that expensive? Knights of Columbus swords aren't that uh, expensive, especially back then. But uh, he totally spoiled it because he had no idea what he was doing. Um, and, and that's very easy to do. So aside from being careful when you're working with sharps, uh, which is always something you should do, uh, if you're working with antiques, don't. Get an expert. Get somebody who knows what they're doing because you can really mess up an antique very easily. So first thing, wood care, um, wooden weapons. Uh, Wood is a, it's one of the five elements. It's a living thing and it needs to take care. And you need to take care of it. Uh, it, it basically, when you've got a stick, you, you've got a tree corpse, right? And that will just degrade if you don't keep it moist, if you don't uh, oil it. It's very important for you to oil your wood. You've got to oil your wood regularly. And by regularly, it really depends on how much you're using it. And it depends on where you live. I live near the ocean. And because of that, uh, it, it, I deal with a lot of mold issues and I deal with a lot of uh, rust issues, high oxidation. So I have to clean my weapons quite a bit. Um, uh, um, I have to maintain things. But if you live in a drier climate, uh, then wood becomes more of an issue. My wood, my wood weapons don't tend to dry out that often. Um, but um, 
uh, I imagine in dry climates they would. And you've got you've got to you've got to take care of that. You've got to layer wood. Um, Trump, I'm actually going to do this. This is one of my uh, wooden uh, wooden canes. Now, there's all kinds of products for oiling wood for taking care of wood. Um, probably the most common. Um, what a lot of people generally think about with fluid care is tongue oil. And tongue oil is actually probably the most traditional because tongue oil is, uh, it actually, it's a, sometimes it's called uh, China wood oil. And it dates back to the uh, time of Confucius, so 500, 400 BCE. Um, it's made from tongue nuts, apparently. And um, it was, it, it's, a, it's a good oil for wood. Um, generally, nowadays, it's hard to get uh, uh, tongue oil in its pure form, and usually it's suspended with turpentine, and uh, you know that's fine. The, the The issue with tongue oil as a wood oil is um, it generally takes multiple coats to get it to get it solidified or to get it stabilized. Um, other alternatives, teak oil is a very common oil that people use, which is tongue oil plus other additives. Usually, um, teak oil is better for hardwoods. So generally people in uh, Chinese martial arts are working with rattan, which is actually a grass. It's not really a, a wood per se, um, and uh, white waxwood. Um, while white waxwood is a, a hardwood, not a, not a conifer, um, it, 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 isn't, it, it isn't always the best to be using teak oil with it. Teak oil would be something more if you're using oak or black walnut or something heavier. Um, there's a lot of products. Um, some of the butcher block oil, I've actually got some butcher block oil here, is a really nice fine oil. Um, uh, I actually am using uh, some lemon oil uh, just because I like the lemony smell. And so, so I'm just pouring a little bit on a little bit of cloth and I just go over the whole weapon with it, right? Just give it a nice coating. Uh, now there's all sorts of furniture oils and that's where you'll find things, right? So you go down the whole length of it. And the thing about oiling is a little dab will do you. Note that it would also change it. Now, right now it's super wet because I just did it, but it would also change the color of the wood a little bit. Now there are some natural oils in the hands like I had mentioned earlier. And sometimes you see old school weapons or rather weapons that have been in school a long time that have a natural patina because people have sweated on them for years. And that's super awesome. But generally, uh, this is a faster, nicer way to do it. And particularly nowadays, I'm just gonna let this sit and dry for a little while. And I'll take that wood up, I'll take that oil up, the excess off uh, later. The thing about um, oil is a little dabble to you. Right. I mean, initially, if you have a raw piece of wood, like a fresh piece of wood, brand new piece of white wax wood, you might want to uh, oil it a little heavier the first couple of times um, and then kind of let it, you know, you basically just wet it down, let it sit for a while, let it soak in and then take up your excess. Uh, with that, well, I'll do that at the very end of this talk. Um, and you can see that wasn't, that wasn't a lot of work. It's really easy to do. How many of you guys are oiling your wood? Anybody? Um, it, it will give you much more uh, uh, a longer life with your your weapons. What happens with wooden weapons is they dry out and crack, and particularly with uh, wushu uh, white waxwood because it's harvested to be very thin, it's very fragile, cracks very easily, and it all it, when it dries out, it becomes brittle. So um, you can extend the life of your weapon very easily by uh, by oiling it regularly. Um, if, what kind of, where do you get these kinds of oils? Hardware stores, uh, anybody who does any work with furniture, there's a lot of furniture oils. Um, and I would go with the, I would advise going for the, the finer one. I, I, I knew a guy who used to lemon pledge his weapons, which um, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, first of all, because aerosols, aerosol propellants aren't that great. Um, second of all, um, uh, it, it's a it's a slipperier, it's more slippery and you don't want it to be slippery. That's where you're going to take all that excess off later. 
Um, and uh, I mean, the lemony smell is nice. That's kind of why I like lemon oil. Um, the main thing, um, the, the main thing is you've got to be really uh, um, careful about which product you use in terms of uh, making the weapon slippery and in terms of what works for you. If you've got a high use weapon, like a staff, for example, that you use every day or every week, um, uh, you, you don't have to go with you know that much rigorous oil work. Um, if, you, if you're gonna store it for a while, you might wanna oil it and, and keep it oiled um, for storage. Uh, there's a whole different thing if you wanna preserve that. Um, so, uh, when, um, oh, somebody's asking about varnish. That's a very good question. Um, no, they don't. That's true. If some of the weapons are varnished or, or, um, or painted, um, I personally don't, I, I don't, don't like that. I, I will actually take the varnishing off, um, and then keep, keep it oiled. Um, that does, um, of course the varnish or a lacquer, does protect your wood. Um, however, it does sometimes reduce the flexibility of it. So that's why I tend to prefer um, working with a more live, more vital wood. Um, sorry, I guess this works with all the questions at the end. So, uh, is there a, uh, a sign that says that that the uh, that the weapon needs oiling? Is there something that that indicates that, like, oh, th this could use a oil? Oh no, not really. I mean, uh, generally, I will oil my weapons every season. Um, obviously if it looks dry, but I mean, it, 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 they pretty much hurt and they look the way they are. Right. Um, the, the, um, no, I, I just kind of do it regularly every once in a while. Cause look, as you see, it, it took me a couple of seconds to do that. Right. It's not that hard, of a big deal. Um, and then, so I try to touch up every, every season, sometimes, you know, every, um, every equinox or something, or every every solstice, like so twice a year. You know, it really depends on your environment. Um, in a drier environment, you might want to do a little bit more. In a wetter environment, like where I live, um, it's not as critical. One of the things I got to watch out more for is, is mold. Um, that's a whole other issue. I mean, really, you want to take care of your wood the same way that you would take care of wooden furniture, um, except uh, avoid like furniture wax. Uh, just because that's too slick. So um, let's take some weapons apart. Um, there's some basic tools that I think everybody needs to have. It's good to have a good vice because that'll keep you keep everything steady. And a key thing when you're taking weapons apart is uh, pad your vice, pad your everything you use. Um, reason for that is that vice your vice your tools they're all hardened and they will bite they will bite into your weapons which means you'll, you'll get like these little uh marks vice grips very important that's what they free stuff up so you'll get these little nicks in your weapons that uh, you really can't do anything about once you've uh, once you've uh, marred them. So one of the nice things about modern weapons nowadays is they're all screw fit. So it's super easy. You just gotta unscrew them. Sometimes they're a little bit rough to open up initially. Uh, note this one has a <laughs> washer, which helps secure the top. This is a nice old traditional Long Chuan Jin uh, pommel, right? Now the old style pommels uh, for Long Chuans tended to be uh, wood core, right? And what they do is they braze some light metal across that wood core. So what does that mean? That means that's actually very fragile as this goes together because metal is stronger than wood. And so you'll see in a lot of these things, people will say, be careful about tightening it down too much. I don't know if you can see this, how there's a little bit of an indent here. And that's because this is an old weapon and somebody tightened it down too much. Um, this is actually a, a, it was a, a broken weapon that I pulled from Tyreclaw and I got to give props to Tyreclaw for loaning me some pieces like this. 
Um, so the thing about this wood core, and you can kind of see on this one too, how it's kind of got sort of an indentation, right? Somebody tightened it down a little bit too much and it started to crimp in. Once this happens, you lose the integrity of the weapon. Um, same thing with wood core in the handle, the collars, these all press fit together. Tight. Again, that wood core, see? And it basically is a couple sheets of flat metal that have been uh, brazed together, like a light brass or a light tin, golden. They, they've actually got a, a laminate over it, which is why it's kind of kind of ugly looking right now because some of that is scratched off. Um, this won't, because it's got this lamination, it, it won't oxidize, but, but it will because they did kind of a terrible job. And you can kind of see inside how it's kind of unclear. They didn't, they didn't gold it on the inside. So actually this traditional way of making gin is pretty fragile. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and except you're trying to do things cheaply and easily. So you can see how that fits in there, how the, the shoulders of the blade fits in and it's got this sort of impression how it, how it kind of uh, has been press fitted in there. So you use wood because it's very malleable. Problem with that is ultimately when you make a sword, you want a certain alignment. Meaning when I'm sitting, when this cigar is sitting, this one's fitting so it's really shiverable, but I don't want it to cant this way or cant that way or cant this way or cant that way. It's all gotta be straight. This should all be in line. And this isn't too bad. It's a little bit lower on this side. But as that piece of wood collapses, you know, you lose your weapon. And that's very unfortunate. Um, because once you go there, you're done. Uh, what might save you? Washers. So just like you saw in this one initially, they placed a washer to re-fortify uh, this collapsed part, this indented part. Right. So now once, and you can put lot, lot washers, you know, every segment of your weapon, um, you just need to kind of make the space for it um, and try and keep it all, keep everything true. So modern Wushu weapons, these are chromed. Now chrome uh, doesn't oxidize. Um, that's the whole point of having chrome. So I can hold it all I want. The, the oils, I mean, I will leave prints on it, but um, it'll just wipe off with the cloth. Um, the thing about okay, the thing about I actually open this one up already, didn't I? Wushu weapons is that they are. Built in slightly a different portion, version. Like this one does not have a wood core, it's empty. And it's actually settled in the part. And it's actually a really nice piece of wood for the handle. Now, these pieces are made from uh, pot metal, usually. Pot metal is a global term that we use for um, uh, kind of a cheap metal, one that's easy to cast. Uh, it, 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 it's a combination of metal, uh, sometimes zinc, tin, lead, aluminum, copper, you know, iron. Uh, this one is one of the new uh, 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 competition Tai Chi swords. And so it's pretty solid. Um, but some of the other ones, uh, pot metal, you you could just drop them and they'll break. And once that breaks, you're done. Um, this one also has a kind of a nice collar to it. Nice throat piece, All right? Which is press fitted on. This would be tough to pull off. I'm not gonna do that actually. So, um, Wushu weapons are actually fairly easy to maintain because they're chrome, they won't oxidize on you. Um, sometimes 
cheaper wushu weapons, uh, hopefully not the competition ones, um, have a light chrome and that can flake. And if that flakes, those flakes can be razor sharp. Um, and then once, of course, it flakes off, uh, rust can get within the weapon. But at that point, you've got a weapon that's probably too cheap that um, um, it's not going to matter. Um, now, uh, I know we talk a lot about cheap weapons coming out of China, and you know there's some beautiful high-end stuff. Uh, but we're we're talking more with this talk about uh, functional weapons, ones that we're using for practice. And if you have like a you know a thousand dollar sword, it's not something that you want to practice with every day. Um, you, you want something that you kind of beat around, you know, leave in the car and stuff. Um, so one of the big issues, uh, so in this one, is that a lot of these aren't finished very well. So for example, sometimes these parts, the way this is done, where these collars are a little sharp, because all this is is a folded piece of metal, right? They just braze that. You can see the braze mark in there. So if this isn't fitted well, um, you may have a little sharp edge. Actually, I just, there's a little sharp here, right? Which doesn't seem like much, but um, you know, when you're, when you're, you're using a lot and when you're gripping onto it, uh, it's the easy way to blister. So once you disassemble these, you can just take a little fine file, you know, and just roll it over very gently. You know, to take that edge off. And uh, that'll save you a lot of oil later. Um, this can happen on all different kinds of weapons. These little collars and things, particularly on the handle. Sometimes you'll find little sharps, sometimes it, just little edges that, uh, that haven't necessarily been finished off. So uh, always inspect your weapons. Uh, I tell you, just this morning I was at practice and uh, one of my classmates lent me one of his uh, staffs, and it was uh, it was new. He'd never used it. He'd had it for a while, but he'd never used it. And um, <laughs> it was a waxwood staff, and had all the little tiny twig bumps on it. So you know, doing like some of the the pull cue shots, um, it was like freaking sandpaper. And he was an iron palm guy, so it, he didn't feel it at all. But you know, I was thinking, man, <sighs> clean up your weapons, bro. <laughs> you know, file that stuff down. That's easy enough to do, you know, smooth out your weapons. You get a, when you get a weapon off the shelf, you're going to want to make it yours. And so you're going to want to uh, adjust it, right? Um, one of the things that's really drives me nuts with modern wushu weapons is people will often take them uh, with athletic tape, which, you know, improves the grip and such. And that's great, you know, um, but the tradition has been just to use white athletic tape, which gets really dirty and dingy. So you get these these wushu weapons with kind of white taped around the handle and across the guard, and it's it just gets filthy and it looks awful. Um, and then I, I get the practicality of you know wanting to have that good grip texture, um, but uh, there's now you know black athletic tape. So uh, if you do that, it won't stain and look horrible. Um, yeah, just use the black tape. The black tape, it's much easier. Um, now, uh, let's see, getting into um, real steel. So, this long drawn blade is actually real steel, and I've been handling it just because I'm going to clean it up after this is all done. Um, so, this will oxidize, right? It's not chromed, it's, uh, it's not sharp either. But, um, you know, all these prints. If I do that, you can see that print, and that'll burn in there if I leave it, if I don't clean it off. Um, so what to do, right? Um, oils and waxes. Um, now I have a product that I, I particularly love. Oh, called Curator's Choice. It's actually designed for antique arms and weapons, uh, particularly guns. It was made by uh, the American Historical Foundation. They don't make this anymore. <laughs> but uh, what it is is the wax. I can cover my whole weapon with that. You know, not only will it um, protect the weapon, protect the blade, but it also adds patina to the wood uh, and it'll protect the guard. Um, you just gotta take off the excess so slippery. Now, uh, using wax is one good way to do it. 
um, I, I had a, a, a gun maker friend that I used to work with, uh, excuse me, gun uh, restorer. And he used to swear by uh, Blue Pearl car wax. Um, in general, I've moved away from wax. Um, I used to use Curious Choice a lot on my pieces, not so much anymore. Now I tend to go again for, uh, for final oils. What I really like is gun products. So this is a gun cloth, right? You can pick up a gun cloth at any place that sells guns, uh, sporting stores, gun stores, obviously. Um, and basically it's a light, soft cloth that's impregnated with a little bit of, uh, sometimes it's silicon, some other protective qualities. And all I do is after, you know, I use it, I can just wipe it down, right? And you can see that that, that came right. You see how it's all kind of dingy here? Good white, and it's all nice, right? And that protect gives me a little protective coat. I find this stuff to be really practical for weapons that I use a lot because a little gun cloth, I can just, you know, just quickly kind of uh, go down over it and uh, after each practice, right, before I put it away. Uh, if you're going to store your weapons, it might be nice to use a drop of oil. Um, now, in general, I would recommend gun products because they, they require the same from their lubricants and protectants that we do for swords, and they're very readily available here in America. Um, do not search the web for gun oil. <laughs> you won't find what you're looking for. That's something completely different. Don't go there. Um, avoid uh, WD-40. Uh, WD-40 is a liquid wrench, and there are other liquid wrenches. Um, those are penetrating oils. So you don't want an oil that's a penetrating oil. Penetrating oil is basically one that uh, it, it's used to free up like, like nuts or bolts that are, too, that are too tight. And so it's got something in there that, that penetrates. Um, you want a protective oil, um, uh, something that's, that's, that's um, light if you're doing a lot of practice, um, it, heavier if you're gonna store your weapon. So um, like a really heavy oil like cosmoline is that's uh, like Vaseline almost. It's really thick. And that's something you'd lay on if you, if you were going to put your sword away for years and only dig it out when you have to take revenge and avenge your family. Um, it, it's a mess because it's really hard to take up and, and clean off. Be careful when you oil uh, that you don't get anything on the handle. You just want to cover that blade. Um, and also be careful, um, uh, it's just a little drop will do you. You don't really need to slather it on, unless you're gonna put it in storage. And if you're gonna put it in storage, you don't wanna store it in your scabbard because that just doesn't work very well. You would store it somewhere else, you know. Um, it, the opportunity for corrosion there is much higher. Uh, Hey, Gene, I think we lost your mic. Uh, we're not hearing you anymore. Sure. Can you now? Yes. Okay. Huh, I don't know what happened there. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, now, this is a competition DAO. The tricky thing with the competition DAO is you don't want to... Um, when you buy some, because it's got this ridge, you just want to put it in sideways so it like that ridge isn't in because otherwise you can't really pin it. I'm pretty loose in these. So. See how tight these things can be sometimes. This one's got a keeper screw, which is what I want to show. Because it's not cooperating right now. So you've got to be, <laughs> it's one of those pre-cooking things where it's like, All right, now, oh, geez. So, sometimes wish weapons have like these little, I don't know what these are. 
these little, I don't know if you can see that, uh, they're little like metal bearings in the pummel, which just spilled out all over my lap. Um, there's not enough of them to significantly change the weight. Uh, I think they put them in there for, for the rattle, even though that doesn't give much more rattle. Um, they're really messy though. And so don't be surprised when that happens. Uh, for a spear point, they actually give you ball bearings, right? Which you uh, place in the spear and then mount this, you know, put some screws in the holes and mount it in. Um, now this is a really funny thing to me. And it's very unique to Chinese martial arts that weapons are, particularly modern wushu weapons, are designed for sound, right? So you have like these little rattles in them. Uh, particularly with Nandao, they don't even put um, the guard on. This one I just pulled apart, but they don't even put this on the way. Right? That way, when you like, move it around, it makes a lot more, more noise, it's more dramatic. Um, obviously, this is for effect. It's not something a real weapon you would do with. Um, in fact, uh, with when I used to make swords, with when I used to do European swords, one of the things that was really key was every sword had to ring. This is because most of the swords I had to do were for theater. And that meant that that once everything was all tight, if I was banging it on a vice, it would, it would ring. Actually, this one does ring because it's so trippy. Um, but it would ring through the guard. Now, Chinese weapons don't do that because of the way our guards are designed. Um, and now they're actually designing them to make more noise. Uh, that's a big differentiation between Chinese weapons and um, and modern ultra weapons. Here's a classic example too of some of an edge that's really sharp right there. So that's something I would want to take down. You know, just take a little fine file and write it along. Otherwise, you always run the, the chance of getting those little paper cuts. Um, most uh, now with that that the Tai Chi Jin, that's a really beautiful piece of wood, right? And if I oil that a little bit, bring that patina out, be lovely. With uh, this, it's, it's like a piece of junk wood. All right, I wanted to show this too. I just got a keeper nut. Um, so this is not a really great surface to be holding onto. And this is something that you would want to wrap with tape. Um, I would actually advise wrapping with, I would put it way out of my reach, handle wrap. Because you can get handle wrap at any sports store, so um, these are and these aren't very expensive, you know, under ten bucks. Uh, most of these nowadays are uh, are synthetics, so they're rubbers or, or polypropylene kind of stuff. Um, super easy to do. Instructions on the back. Basically, you just start the start rolling it, wrap it around tightly, seal it. Um, it looks a lot better than. Uh, using athletic tape. And it performs a lot better because this is designed for rackets. And uh, that's, that's exactly what you need. So here's a piece I did a long time ago. This is my old tournament sword, right? There's a leather wrap, you can still get leather wraps, right? And here is because old school, it's peened, right? There's no screw. So when I had to take this thing apart, I literally had to, to hammer out the, the tang, you know, heat it up, hammer it out, heat it back up again, hammer it back in again, old school stuff. This is actually a chrome weapon too. And you can see on the inside of the guard where they didn't chrome that part. Interesting point about uh, competition weapons. Now, I may not have the most recent IWF rules, but even, uh, my, the last one that I read, which must have been a couple months ago, um, there are no stipulations on modifications for weapons, which is really intriguing. Um, right now, the way uh, a competition wushu weapon is defined is, you know, it's from a certified company, but they haven't put out specs to my knowledge. I mean, aside from the fact that, you know, the general length that I'm going to hold it, so it should be eyebrow height and, and you know, the, the spear should be hand height or whatever. Um, there aren't weight specifications, there aren't, uh, you know, rigidity specifications, any sort of specifications at all. Uh, and beyond that, there's no real regulations on modification. So um, there are some amazing grip surfaces. You know, I used to really love leather. Um, 
but I moved more to the synth- synthetics lately. The problem with the synthetics is they will break down over time, but no matter what, you're gonna have to redo it every once in a while anyway. Um, but the synthetics, you know, uh, tennis is a big sport. So they put a lot of energy and thought into how, what kind of materials you use to wrap. Um, and, uh, you know, it wicks away sweat. It's got the right tackiness that it gives you a good grip purchase. You know, it's often textured in some ways. Uh, that's great stuff, you know, and it's really easy to do. Why modern Wushu people don't put that on their weapons? Why traditional guys don't put that on their weapons? I mean, some do, but it's such a no-brainer, and it's so easy to do. Anybody can do this. Um, here's another point. So if you look very carefully, I notched this one, right? You can see that notch right there. It's a thumb notch. You see it? A little indented. So when I took this apart, I've added that notch so when I'm gripping it, my thumb has a little extra purchase because this used to be my, my competition sword. Um, and you could notch, you know, like, like, like totally corrugate and notch these. There's no stipulation against modification at this point. That may change at some point, but at this point there isn't. And certainly with traditional competition, there's no reason why you would need to do that because nobody even looks at that. All we want to make sure is that it stands on its end, right? It doesn't fold over. Doing that, so standing on its end. Um, so, in terms of weapon modification, I mean, you really need to make it yours. You know, you can do whatever you want to do that. Um, make it fit your hand. You know, I've, I've seen some very complex variations. If you look at, say, modern fencing, uh, there are weapons uh, with their ornate pistol grips and spur grips, or even target shooting and um, archery. The grips are very ornate um, to give you the best purchase. And while certainly for some things like the straight sword, like the tian, you know, simplest is best, you know, for other things, particularly in competition where you don't want your weapon flying out of your hand, giving yourself that advantage of, of a little bit of notching, a little, a little line notching, you know, that's what I used to do. <laughs> Didn't really make me win a lot, but for the record. Um, in terms of cleaning weapons, there are a ton of products. Um, you can get things like uh, cleaning claws. I actually have a little kit that I'm diving in here to and out my little weapons box, which has all this you know, stuff for cleaning. Cleaning claws, which are you know, polishing claws. There's also some stuff for metal. Um, I prefer a product called uh, Ween All. Can't really see it there now. Because um, it comes in different grades. A lot of people like flits. Um, now, the, which weapons would you clean? Uh, well, you, obviously things that are chromed don't need cleaning. Um, you just wipe them down. But things that are real steel, like, like this, would need a clean, right, if it, get, if it prints up. And weapons that have, like this one that has, this has an actual brass, solid brass guard, right? So this is a solid piece of hammered brass. You can kind of see that's hammered brass. And you can see how it's all patinaed up. Brass is an amazing metal. You can bury it in the ground, dig it up years later, clean it up. It wouldn't have corroded. It tarnishes. So it's different, right? And some people like that corrosion. I can take the flits. Actually, I did this wean all just a few minutes ago before I went on, polish it up, and it gets all mirror, right? It's like one of those cooking shows where you do all the prep, and then you stick it in the oven, you pull out the thing that it's done. And I did just half the pummel so you can see. You see how that, that side's all patinaed and this other side I polished up. So metal cleaners, there's products for metal um, that can clean and restore if you're, if you're dealing with real weapons. Um, this particular blade is actually stainless steel. So it's stainless means it doesn't oxidize. So um, a little different than, than the ones that are high carbon. So ultimately, you really just need to kind of experiment with it. With metal cleaners and metal polishes, remember, to do a polish just means making all the scratches go in the same direction. So um, generally with polishing tools, you should with like something more aggressive. Don't use um, a, a grinder buffer, a power buffer, unless you know what you're doing. And the reason why I say not to do that is 
Um, it can create heat. And if you heat up your blade too much, it'll change your temper, it'll spoil your temper. Um, you have to constantly cool it uh, if you're gonna polish it that way. But most of the times, I mean, most of the weapons that we get um, supplied with, uh, they're already polished, they just need to be cleaned. And so you can take a more aggressive, like what I have with the Wien all, a more aggressive cleaner. You can use a little bit of uh, steel wool, like steel wool, or maybe super fine drip sandpaper, take out like big pieces of oxidation if you have it. Um, and just work your way down. Like, keep in mind, this is a lot of repetitive, small motion, you know, cleaning. I mean, if you've got a Dremel tool, that's all those little spinny things, you know, that's another that could that could speed up your uh, your ability to clean. But if you've got a Dremel tool, then probably everything I've said so far is not <laughs> that you know about. Um, so, uh, in terms of taking care of these weapons, it, it's really critical in terms for the higher end weapons, right? Or even the, the, the middle end, middle area weapons. Cheap weapons are cheap weapons. You know, you really, uh, if you've got something that's completely chromed up and pop metal guard, all you gotta do is not drop it so it doesn't break. Um, just wipe it down so it didn't get, you know, with any kind of cloth. Um, with, um, but with real steel, uh, or even ones that, you know, like the old Lung Tuan blades or if you're getting blades out of Shaolin, uh, anything that's not chromed, you do have to maintain it. Um, let's get back to our little piece of wood, shall we? Now, this should be plenty dry. And all I wanna do is take off that excess oil. Oh, lovely. A nice soft cloth. Keep in mind, working with a lot of this stuff, cleaners, and you know, I've got my nice new uh, USA WKF shirt. Um, cleaners and stuff, uh, uh, and 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 oils, they will stain. So um, don't uh, wear your bet finest. This is this is dirty work. Your hands will get dirty. Um, and see, brings back the, the patina. Or is the health of the wood, and we're good to go for another six months or so. Now you can also do this on sword handles if you've got good wood. Um, interesting thing, I mean, I was, I was pointing out this, this uh, Tai Chi Tian, this competition Tai Chi Tian, which has this lovely piece of hardwood as a handle. Um, Traditionally, weapons uh, were wrapped. Chinese weapons were wrapped, kind of like um, like uh, you see samurai swords, uh, katanas. They have that silk cord wrap. You actually saw silk and cord wrap. You saw uh, the shark skin or ray skin, just like you do with the katana. Uh, same uh, as an under thing. It's a, it's a great texture. Um, you saw a lot of hemp cord. Um, the thing is, what has survived to us, most of that stuff decayed. And so we often see weapons that are just bare, right? And are just, um, just empty, right? Uh, and there were some examples where you do see swords where they were just bare. But for the most part, people would grip them with something um, just to give you a better purchase. Um, and and you, you, you'll feel the difference. Uh, there's been lately uh, a dramatic move away from um, any sort of grip, any sort of gripping, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, I think there was a trend in even the traditional weapons that that came up in, God, I would say that that, that must have been like the 90s where uh, they would do these like kind of janky little cord wraps um, of just a light cloth that would fall apart right away. And then you'd be left with you know bare wood, or if you were, I mean, this this dowel that I brought in earlier that had that it was just like a two color cloth wrap, and that eventually came off. They didn't even like ta ta uh, glue it down, you know. It just came. It was just wrapped around, not very tightly. And so you have to replace that, you know, unless you want to work bare wood. Um, personally, uh, I will handle ones that are nice. Or, or excuse me, I'll have ones that aren't nice. You know, I've got a nice piece of wood. I love a nice piece of wood. Uh, keep in mind that also, like this wood, just like that wood, does need some oil and care. 
Um, even the scabbard, we're gonna have the scabbard. We're gonna have the scabbard here. Yes. So even the scabbard needs to be taken care of, right? So oil, you know, just a little bit of oil and take it up after, you know. Uh, thing about scabbards, you gotta keep in mind too, don't store your blades in the sun or the banana on you, right? So this is actually very true, but I had one that really worked badly. Um, and turn your weapons a lot, right? Because if they're always sitting the same way, you know, like if you got a display rack, they'll eventually warp. So you're gonna have to flip them over every once in a while just to keep them going. And basically, you know, use your weapons. Don't let them, let them rest in the racks. Um, basically, all you really need to know for weapons care, I mean, aside from, you know, padding your vice and using, you know, basic disassembly, which is very, very easy, um, how to take care of metal, how to take care of wood. And there's plenty of products available in the market. Oh, I want to show you this too. This is, there's actually a product that's readily available. This is kind of messy. Um, you know, Hanoi puts out a sword oil that's specific. Uh, and it's a really nice oil. It's a little heavy for my taste. And uh, these containers, they come in a little pump spray bottle, always go sour on me, which is why I have it in this bag and it's leaked all the bag and I've got oil all over my hands. Um, that drives me nuts. But it's a nice fragrant oil. Um, and it's specifically designed for swords. Uh, but really, you need to kind of find, depending on your environment, uh, what kind of climate you live on, live in, because that will adjust or that will affect oxidation and drying out of wood, and what your usage is. So if you're using a weapon a lot, um, how much you've got to do to maintain it. Just like if you're driving a car a lot, you've got to change the oil a little bit more. If you're not going to drive that car, you have to set it up to store. So for a, for a higher end weapon, um, if you're not going to use it a lot, oil it down, make it make it save it. Because believe me, if, if you get a, if you get some oxidation and the oxidation gets deep enough to pit, you know, meaning that it that it actually starts degrading, you know, and forms little craters of oxidation in your metal. That's a real pain to take out because you've got to sand it and sand it and sand it. And, uh, you know, metal isn't the easiest thing to sand. So um, you know, definitely do what you can to maintain uh, the, the life of your weapons. Uh, it, it's really uh, it's really simple, actually. Um, and then these are just all little things. You can get into really deep things in terms of disassembly, like trying to square your, uh, your guard and stuff and trying to make everything perfectly aligned uh that's more of an issue when i was doing swords for european swords because of just the nature of their design um with chinese swords alignment i mean if you look at the actual um the historic examples of course they're all aligned but if you look at you know the sort of the store bought examples they're often very crooked and uh you know so for example now this one's actually because the Dow is going to have a bunch of alignment. So you've got this alignment this way, right? This should be completely, the guard should be completely orthogonal to the blade. And the way you'll have to do that if it's out of alignment is to uh, adjust the shoulders. And so what I would have to do is got an extra keeper screw underneath the pommel along with this washer. So what I would have to do, and you see how that's basically cut in there, All right? It's actually just, this was probably straight and probably bent it to cant it. But I would have to take my file and square those shoulders so this sat perfectly well. Uh, word, to, word of caution, when you're doing this stuff, uh, if you're first time you're doing it, uh, take a little piece of tape and mark which side is the blade end, mark which side is the right side and left side. If you get that turned around, it can be very confusing. Also, um, if you're doing like a little bit, like a little bit of, uh, if you don't want to disassemble it and you want to take those edges off, tape your weapon, protect your weapon. Cause if you just skip a little bit with a file, you put a scratch in and you know, that just looks 
terrible. Um, I mean, right now, like I said, people don't really take that much care of their weapons, so they probably wouldn't be noticed that scratch. But um, as a weapon person myself, I mean, I only notice it. And, uh, you know, you, you, you want your, your weapon is an extension of yourself. And so you want that to be in, in prime operating condition. Um, okay, so I guess there were some, I saw some questions come up. So I guess about the question period. Uh, we have a question. Any opinion on using Coca-Cola to wash away light rust on carbon steel? <laughs> yeah, that's like a funny trick people will do. With the, you can do that with like copper coins and stuff. Um, I've never done that with high carbon steel. Um, so I don't really have that much of an opinion on it. Uh, I guess I'm kind of old fashioned about that. And because there are good metal cleaners on the market, I use those. Um, but yeah, the Coca-Cola trick is something you can do with, uh, I guess people do that with jewelry and stuff too. Um, I don't know that I would do that. What with the blade, eh. Personally, personally, I wouldn't. I, I don't know why, how effective it is in terms of high carbon steel. Um, I definitely would not do it on the guard uh, in case you had a guard that was actually a steel guard or made of some metal other than bot metal that needed cleaning because guards are generally very textured and it just might be hard to get the Coca-Cola off after it's, I don't know. I've never really worked with that. So I guess the, the honest answer is my gut reaction is not to do that because there are products specifically for it. But, you know, prove me wrong. Maybe it is uh, a good way to go. Maybe it's cheaper. I just, I, you know, I'm just not in the, putting my swords in soda. Uh, how about camellia oil? Camellia oil. Um, with access to camellia oil, that's uh, awesome. Finer oil is better, you know? Like, so, uh, for example, when I did kendo, um, we used to have to oil the shinai, the bamboo, split bamboo swords and um, they were really stuck on certain nut oils and I can't remember if it was walnut or almond oil right now but there was a process you think I remember this because I didn't do this um, where you'd have to take these nuts and put them in cheesecloth and smash them up with a meat tenderizer just to get the oil in the cheesecloth and then run it up and down so uh, you know fire oils yeah fire oils are better just like with cooking you know uh, if you've got a really nice weapon um uh, use fine oil and there actually is you can get uh samurai sword cleaning kits and i, I thought about digging mine out but then i thought uh, you know that's a whole i'm sure you can find somewhere on youtube where people show how to do that because you've got to like oil it and you got to use the special paper and then you got to powder it stick up the oil it's a big process and i'm not very good at it and uh you know i i um while i'm a traditionalist i'll default to modern products because you know, it's just easier. And, you know, I, I really just want to train with my weapons. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time messing with them in terms of cleaning with them. You know, I just want them to be in good shape and not fly off at the handle, literally. Someone, uh, someone asked, can we see again the taping of your, of your sword handle? Oh, uh, <laughs> this is a very old job, so it's not, uh, yeah, so... Um, okay. So all I did with this, this is a, a basic handle, uh, uh, a typical leather uh, handle covering. And usually those come with like a little, a secure on one side and they're often tacky. So they, they, they'll have like some sort of tape you pull off like for an envelope, resealable envelope that'll lay it down. Um, what I will often do, and this was a long time ago when I did this, so I don't really remember. What I will often do is uh, lay down like some barge cement on the uh, inside on, on the on the raw wood, and then lay down some barge cement on uh, the strip of leather or whatever the handling is, and then tape it down. Then I actually I, I actually tape this down with some um, just to secure it and smooth it out because this was a big worker for me a long time. Honestly, I haven't touched this sword in a long time, so it's kind of fun to feel it again. Um, a lot of times these little kits, and here I can show you with this one, um, see it actually has a collar. So this is the plastic strap or whatever it is. Foam comfort backing, tacky service, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's made of, they don't tell me. I don't know. 
But um, so yeah, no, you can't really see that. But there, there's there's like a strip of backing, and when you open it up, you pull it out and it's sticky, and you put it on. And then they have this this one collar piece which might fit for a gen. I probably have to disassemble it and take the pommel off to get that over. Um, I mean, you can just use good solid tape. You know, I imagine you could, you know, if you trim gorilla tape, that would work. I mean, there are all kinds of good, you know. Uh, texture tapes that might work. There's actually athletic tapes that'll work really well. And then we have one question. Um, the, the waxwood staff has warped. So any recommendations on how to straighten it? Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. It depends on how hard the warp is. So um, waxwood staffs actually will bend a bit in terms of like, like, like if I don't have a wax step with me, maybe I can use this as sort of an example. So if this has a warp in it, right? This one's actually true, so it doesn't out. Um, I, I could actually just like lean on it and push it back. It'll return to that warp place, depending on how thick and how solid that, that piece of, uh, of wax wood is. Um, you can weight it. So for example, I would, you know, put it on some something solid, and then put something so and brace it up so it's facing the uh, the proper direction and then kind of counter uh, that warp and just let it sit there for a little while. Um, I would oil it heavily before I did that and hope that it would retain or or, or, or bend back. Um, I mean, it depends on bad the warp is. Some of them are just warped because that's the way the tree grew. Um, it, and it also depends on the thickness and the severity. Um, one other real big caveat with wax wood is uh, that termites love that stuff. Um, I had a beautiful Bodhidharma cane that I brought back from Shaolin, and I literally watched termites eat it in front of my eyes. You know, they, 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 in a matter of uh, a day or two, they had just totally worm eaten it. And uh, so, so that's something you've got to be very cautious of. And I know, I know some masters will do things like spray down there their um, wax wood with, with bug repellent, which I think is so nasty because, you know, you're putting that in your hands, you know, um, uh, mainly just protect it. And the oils will help with that a little bit. It offers, you know, some sort of, hopefully something that throws the bugs off. Um, but uh, anybody who's dealt with a lot of wax wood at some point has had to deal with termites and they're vicious. They just love the stuff and they will ruin a shipment of, of, of uh, white wax wood in a matter of a week or so. Um, so be careful where you store your stuff, right? Kind of like what I was saying about turning your weapons around a lot. You know, just just uh, don't let don't let your weapons lie dormant because they won't be in good shape when you pick them up again. It's not like in the movies when you have to pull the your grandfather's sword out to take vengeance and restore the honor of the temple or anything and it's all gleaming and shining you know you pull it out it's gonna be all rusty and broken all right thank you so much i think all the questions have been uh, answered pretty good this is a, a great session and you shared a lot of information with us so that's awesome all right thanks uh, everybody you know if people have random questions I'm, I'm very available on social media so just reach out and maybe you'll have the answer Awesome. Thank you, Gene. All right. Thank you, guys.